Ladies and gentlemen, please begin to take your seats. Our program will begin momentarily. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Steve. Welcome to our cafe. Feels just like a small cafe in maybe Cairo or Beirut or Paris, a little bit less smoking, which we appreciate. I don't think that's allowed here. Uh, my name is Peter Greenberger, and I'm the publisher of The Hill. Thank you all so much for coming out on this cold morning to join us for a conversation about aspirations, Arab youth, and the modern dream. I'd like to begin by thanking our event underwriter, the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates, for supporting this morning's program, as well as for supporting a dialogue that's been going on now for a few weeks at different conversations in town. The Middle East, home to roughly 400 million people, is often featured in the headlines for its vast energy resources and the near constant state of conflict and tension. But as those traditional narratives continue to dominate, many are failing to amplify the voices of Arab youth, a population of 240 million people under the age of 30 who are frustrated with their current socioeconomic and political conditions. From education and the arts to economic opportunity and innovation, where do their aspirations lie? And from our perspective, why should Americans care? Why is this so important to us? This morning we will hear from congressional leaders, Arab students, and youth policy experts for what we hope expands our understanding of the region, its youth, global interconnectedness, and the appeal of modern opportunity. Before we get started, a few quick housekeeping notes here. In addition to our audience here at the museum, we're live streaming on thehill.com as well on the Hill's Facebook page. Please keep your phones on silent throughout the program, but we do encourage you to engage in the conversation. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, at The Hill Events, and please do join that conversation using the hashtag The Hill Arab Youth. 
We will be taking questions throughout the program, so be on the lookout for members of our team with handheld mics. <laughs> That's right, and Steve is not the waiter, but do feel free to ask him if you need to freshen up your coffee. Finally, at the end of... <laughs> At the end uh, of the program, those here in the room will receive an electronic survey uh, to get feedback. We'd love your input. We want to make these more engaging, more interesting going forward, so please do fill that out. Before we begin, I, it is my great pleasure to introduce our underwriter, the Embassy of the United Arab Emirates, for brief remarks. Please join me in welcoming Shema Gargash, Deputy Chief of Mission with the Embassy of the UAE. Shema? The floor is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Steve, uh, for convening this important discussion. And uh, thank you, The Hill, for partnering with the UA Embassy um, to shed light on the thoughts and attitudes of the youth in the Arab world through the Arab Youth Survey. It's refreshing to have a conversation in Washington about the Middle East um, that focuses on ways to create a more hopeful future. I've been in Washington for just over four years and I've lost count of all the discussions about the strife and instability facing the Middle East. However, I can count on one hand the number of meetings that explored how we can collectively channel the power of young people across the region. If we go down to the basics, all youth in every part of the world want the same things. They want to feel safe and have opportunities to build a better future regardless of the circumstances. Every country must work to ensure a stable and prosperous future for its next generation. And helping to build better futures for Arab youth um, and youth everywhere is the responsibility of all of us. Just by turning on the news, it's not difficult to understand why um, to understand why uh, Arab youth are concerned about their futures, the rising cost, uh, cost of living, high unemployment, not to mention security situations, all weigh significantly on the shoulders of Arab youth. We live in a volatile region, but we also live in an interconnected world where every issue today is global and very relatable. Whether we're talking about the mobility of people, the quality of education, the aff uh, affordability of basic needs, and the list goes on. The Arab world has around 420 million people, of which 65% of them fall under the age of 30. And while we must move forward with the belief that our future is in the hands of our youth, we also need to do all we can today to empower them and provide them the tools and resources to build a prosperous future. We want to stop the brain drain and encourage talents to flourish in the region with the support of governments in the private sector. We can see why it can be easy to feel no hope for the future, but the results from the Arab Youth Survey paint a more promising picture driven by its youth. The survey highlights their hopes, fears, and priorities, and we should pay attention to the survey's results. They provide us with a roadmap on how we should invest in the region moving forward and where we can improve. In the UAE, we're, we're taking lessons from the survey and examining how to apply them to new policies and create new opportunities. It is my hope that others do the same and help us create a more stable and prosperous region. Thank you for your time and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Shema. With that, let's get the program started. Please welcome Dom Barkness, Vice President at USDAA ASTA BCW, leading the agency's enterprise and technology practice in Dubai. Dom will be sharing some of the key survey findings his team has identified in the 2019 Arab Youth Survey. Dom, over to you. Thank you, good morning. Um, I'm based in Dubai and um, it's great to be back in DC. DC is home. Ha DC has been home for 10 years. While it's significantly colder currently in DC than it is in Dubai, uh, it, it's great to be back. And thank you to the Hill and the UAE Embassy for this opportunity to share some important findings, research findings with you. Um, as mentioned, I'm a vice president at ASDA BCW uh, in Dubai. It was 11 years ago that our agency. Um, was facing an interesting or came about to an interesting obstacle 
there was no hard, good data we could use to help our clients, governments, and businesses to understand and reach out to young people in the Middle East. As previous speakers mentioned, two-thirds of uh, the region's population are under the age of 30. It's one of the youngest uh, regions in the world. Uh, this lack of research provided us um, the reason to establish this thought leadership initiative, uh, Airview Survey, uh, which we have been doing for the past 11 years. Uh, the original aim of the survey was to provide actionable data that governments and businesses could use to make better decisions. Um, at this, the survey has excelled, becoming a much anticipated resource for governments, multinationals, locals, local enterprises, and regional and global media. Over the years, the survey has grown to become more than just exercise in research. It has become a platform for young Arabs to have their voices heard around the world, a forum for debate on the Middle East, Middle East future, and a trackable chain of insights and analysis stretching back more than a decade. So just very quickly about the survey itself. Um, um, the survey was launched in 2008. Uh, this year we did 3,300 face-to-face interviews. And it is important to note face-to-face uh, -face aspect. While in US and Europe, uh, a lot of the polling is done online and through telephone. In the Middle East, face-to-face -face is still the way to go to make sure that you get representative data. Uh, we poll in the study 18, 24-year-old young Arabs. Uh, all of these respondents are nationals of those countries. So for example, in a lot of countries, there are a lot of expats in Saudi or UAE. So we only speak to nationals. So in the UAE, we only speak to Emiratis. Uh, in Saudi, we only speak to Saudi citizens. Uh, we do poll 50-50% gender split. So 50% men, 50% women. Uh, and Throughout the survey, uh, we do uh, we interview 15 countries and we divide them in three different regions. So the GCC, the Gulf states, uh, which include uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, uh, North, uh, North Africa, which include Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, and Tunisia, and then also Levant and what we call others. So uh, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestinian ter territories, and Yemen. And that's an important um, difference to note because uh, while a lot of people treat the region as one region, there, these three areas are very different in terms of what are the issues and what these young people in those different regions want. Uh, very quickly, uh, the interviews were done in January, uh, from January 6th to January 29th by professional interviewers. Respondents had the option uh, to conduct the interview in English or Arabic. Vast majority chose to conduct the inter to complete the interview in Arabic. The margin of error is plus or minus uh, 1.6 points uh, and larger for subgroups. As you can see here, we do the study in 15 countries and we go beyond just uh, going in the capital cities and we try to do uh, to make sure that our sample is representative of the overall country as possible. So we try to reach different regions where might be different cultural, political affiliations to paint. Uh, yeah, I know you, you can tell I'm a pollster by training, so I can talk about this for 20 minutes. Uh, just uh, because we do get questions on this uh, in terms of the sample size. So we do take the approach of what you would call the Senate approach. So regardless of how big the country is, we weight the data that each country gets the same vote instead of doing, if we were to do by population, uh, the survey would become more of a North African Arab uh, survey because of the uh, population of Egypt and other countries. Okay, let's get to the findings. So um, overall, every year we do 10 findings uh, that we pick out. In some years, it's, it's gonna be a mix of uh, um, tracking data and some new topics. Uh, this year, we released the survey back in April uh, today, I'm not going to take you through all 10 findings. Uh, we're focusing on four findings, which we think are the most relevant for today's discussion. Uh, so the first one is uh, about religion, that young Arabs say religion plays too big of a role in the Middle East and religious institutions need to be reformed. So we ask them a question, 
Uh, how strongly do you agree or disagree that religion plays too big of a role? And as you can see, 66% say that religion does play too big of a role in the region. Only 24% disagree. Even more, 79% say the Arab world needs to reform its religious institutions. And the first number, uh, the 66% on the religion plays too big of a role, uh, over the past four or five years, that number has been really increasing. Uh, back in 2015, only 50% fi said uh, that religion plays too big of a role, and now we're seeing it 66%. Even more interestingly is then we put a uh, statement from them, Arab world's religious values are holding the Arab world back. 50% in the region agree with that statement. And if you look by uh, different regions in GCC, 45% agree, North Africa, 46%, and a significantly higher agreement in Levant at 61%. And uh, it, before we move on to the next finding, I think it is important to note that this should not be necessarily mistaken that young Arabs are becoming less religious. Uh, throughout the years, we ask them what are the most important things to their identity, and family and religion always come at top. What this data is showing us is that uh, young Arabs m want more of a separation between state and religious institutions. So it doesn't mean religion, they, they're no longer religious, they just don't want religious institu institutions to be as active in their daily lives. Uh, the second finding is about the government role. Um, and this is probably very timely uh, considering what's, what's happening in the region. Every year we ask uh, respondents about um, what are the biggest issues facing the region. And uh, as you can see this year, uh, economic issues, rising cost of living, and unemployment are the top issues by far uh, exceeding other issues. And we saw the same thing in 2018, these two issues being at the top, and that is a change from uh, a few years ago uh, when, we had <coughs> when we had the threat of ISIS uh, and, in general, the threat of terrorism dominate the headlines and uh, top the concerns. And keeping in mind that uh, young Arabs are concerned with economic uh, issues, uh, we ask them, do you think that your country is doing enough to support your fa young families? And 65% uh, say that their country does not do enough to support young families. If you look at GCC, 39% uh, say uh, their country is not doing enough. But then if you go to North Africa, 74% say uh, their country is not doing enough. And in Levant, it's 83%. So keeping in mind that they're concerned about economic issues and they don't think the government is doing enough to support them, we ask them, what do, you, what do they expect their government to do for them? And this is, if I had to pick one slide, which is the most fascinating slide for me, and probably for a lot of Americans would be the most shocking slide, is this slide. So we ask them, what do they think is the government responsibility? So for example, safety and security, we gave them the choices. Do you think safety and security is the, response, the government's responsibility to provide to all citizens, only those in needs, or to no one. It's not a government's responsibility to do that. So 96%, uh, not surprisingly, say safety and security should be provided to all citizens. Uh, education and healthcare, 89% and 88%. Not very surprising, but this is where things get pretty interesting. 78% uh, say it is the government's uh, responsibility to provide energy subsidies to all citizens. 78% also say it's the government's responsibility to provide jobs to all citizens. 60% uh, say it's the government's responsibility to provide housing. And one in three say the government should pay off their personal debt. Uh, so pretty, pretty interesting uh, findings here. Now thinking more about foreign relations and probably uh, how more relevant how U.S. is perceived. So in a major reversal since 2016, we have seen that young Arabs now, or a majority of young Arabs now, view U.S. as an enemy. Yes. It is. So the question, uh, the question is actually, do you consider, and then a country, 
a strong ally, somewhat of an ally, somewhat of an enemy, or a strong enemy of your country. So if you look, and we ask this question about a number of different countries, uh, UAE is seen as a top ally by 93%, Egypt 84%, Saudi 80% say uh, Saudi Arabia is an ally. When you look at United States, 41% ally, 59% uh, enemy, and that places the U.S. closer to Iran uh, than any uh, Western Arab country that we're testing. And, uh, you know, the, the benefit of doing the study over the years is that you can track data, and in polling you don't see shifts like that very often. So if you look at 2016, 63% uh, said U.S. was an ally. That dropped in 2017 to 46%, further dropped to 35% in 2018, and now it's at 41% saying it's an ally versus 59% enemy. And uh, while perceptions of the U.S. have been declining, uh, Russia seems to benefit a bit. Uh, so the blue line here is perceptions of Russia as an ally, and the green line is perceptions of uh, U.S. as an ally. And as you can see, between 2016 and 2017, uh, the two co countries were, perceptions of the two countries were fairly close. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, there's a big gap, especially 2018, because Russia took a, a big uh, uh, stance in Syria, uh, and uh, we can see how numbers shifted there. Uh, this year, we did ask them uh, kind of a horse race question. Uh, out of the two countries, U.S. and Russia, uh, which of those two countries is a stronger ally of your country? Uh, and as you can see, it's 38% uh, for U.S. and 37% uh, for Russia, 25% saying neither of the two countries is an ally. And it is an interesting regional split here, GCC. It's a little bit more pro-U.S. North Africa also uh, a little bit more uh, pro-U.S., but one in three are actually say that neither of the two countries is an ally. But then if you go to Levant, uh, it's by far more pro-Russian, with 45% saying Russia is a stronger ally than U.S. And um, the last finding that we're going to share today is uh, about model nations. So while perceptions of U.S. Uh, or U.S. foreign policy are really declining, but young Arabs are able uh, to make a distinction uh, and have a nuanced understanding uh, between foreign policy and U.S. as a country. So young Arabs still view U.S. Uh, as one of the top countries to live in and to emulate. This is a question that we have asked for over the past eight or nine years, uh, and we ask them which country in the world, if any, would you like to live in? Uh, so consistently, U.S. has come in in the top two or three, uh, and consistently, UAE has come in at number one uh, this year, 44% UAE saying that it's the top country to live in, uh, followed by Canada at 22% and U.S. at 21%. We also ask them about which country should their own country emulate or be more like. And here again, the U.S. is consistently in the top two or top three, followed by UAE. A couple points to note here. I think uh, what they're able, the nuanced understanding that we have is that they can separate between the policies that are coming from D.C. Uh, versus U.S. that they're seeing on their Instagram feed or uh, when we watch Netflix or Hollywood movies that U.S. still stands something for something culturally to look up to. Uh, and then in terms of UAE, we do get asked this question, uh, how come UAE is so far ahead? If you look at the slide that was about the top issues, economic issues and, um, and safety and security issues are the top issues facing the region. And we have asked them throughout the years, why do you, why do you choose UAE as a top country to live in? And what they mention is that the main reasons are jobs and safety and security. And if, if you have to pick a country to go to, uh, UE is fairly close in, in terms of geography, culture, religion. Um, so it does make sense why so many young Arabs are drawn to, to the UAE. And um, American brands are also among the top brands 
uh, that young Arabs look up to, so followed by Japan, Japanese brands and German brands, American brands come in in the top three. Uh, just very quickly, a uh, quick overview of the findings of religion, uh, religious institutions, uh, they want them to be reformed and religion to play less of a role. Government role, have very high expectations for the government and what the government's responsibility uh, should be to the young people and young families. Foreign relations, uh, you perceptions of the US have shifted dramatically over the past three years. And model nations, while um, in terms of foreign relations, US perceptions have declined. US is still seen as one of the top countries to live in and emulate. Uh, so thank you again for, for having us and uh, allowing us to share uh, this finding. This is uh, an interesting thought leadership project that we do completely independently and funded by our agency. Um, so well, that, thank you. Yep. Um, and, and, and thank you for going to the different dimensions. I want to add a little bit. We've got, we've got um, some students online. We're going to bring them online. I'm going to leave you up there. I want to uh, also explain why I got into this. I actually like this study. Uh, I, I got into the study in the tabs before. Uh, those of you, many of you are my friends. You know I go to the Middle East a lot, all over North Africa, region, uh, various countries in the Middle East. And I spend a lot of time uh, with young people, uh, both in uh, stressed uh, out places. We have a lot of people in this room today that are very involved uh, with what's, what's unfolding in Lebanon right now. Uh, and in other places, Iraq uh, right now, where if you look at the aspirations of people and you kind of look at what they want, it's just clear and predictable uh, to some degree when they want to have uh, more modern circumstances, greater opportunity, better educational institutions, a kind of secular tilt. But I also wanted to raise things that you didn't share, and this is all available online if uh, folks want to go deeper. Uh, but they want, they want these conflicts in the region to end, these silly conflicts uh, that are going on. They see drug use on the rise everywhere in the region. Uh, uh, not a positive story. Uh, but they worry about mental health and their, the absence of mental health uh, services and support uh, in the region. They, um, they trust social media far more than they do their traditional media uh, and the conventional media that is there. So these are other dimensions that, that largely whether you're in North Africa or you're in the GCC area or you're in the Levant, I think that you, you find this sort of difference going on. And honestly, you, you also see a lot of people, a friend of mine is an investor, was involved with Kareem. Uh, Kareem is a, a car service, kind of like an Uber, and it just got purchased for a few billion dollars by Uber, but it was a Dubai-based company. And when I was at the Atlantic uh, magazine, we did an event over in the Middle East on basically what comes next, technology, entrepreneurship, and the sort of the dirty story of that, the not so good story, is throughout the Middle East, uh, uh, really everywhere, if you have the culture that you have in Silicon Valley, which means you start up and fail, you start up and fail, and you start up and succeed, you're in jail a couple of times in the Middle East. Like, it, the, the liabilities and personal loss on that are significant. And I think some countries are trying to sort of resolve that, but the character loss is kind of like a Asia, where it's a you know, built-in loss of face, but it's also a loss of freedom and a loss of uh, latitude. So these are the not... Uh, uh, good stories that are part of this. But let me bring on, do we have a, hey, these are students. So I, I happen to be wanting to be where it's warm. Uh, these are 15 students from Miami-Dade College. Michael Lenahan is a great professor uh, down there. And I said, hey, I'd like to connect some of our youth to your youth. And let me tell you who's in the room. So hi, everybody. I don't know if you can, I'm, I'm looking at a screen. Hey, everybody. Uh, we have got a whole room full of people here. We've got Amanda Box, uh, Cheryl Donaldson, Angie Gaetan, Ronald Lamb, Luis Martin, Daniela gonzalez Millet. I'm probably getting these names wrong, Mar Mar Maria Paura, uh, Dyron Perez, Lilian Rojas, Barbara Silver Silvera, Stephanie Smith, Manuel Soltero, Malachi Suttle, George Chavez Velarde, and Ebony Williams. Uh, these are uh, uh, folks from, they, their ages range from 21 to 46. They come from the U.S. and five other countries. There are three veterans, 10 professional areas. It's a cool crowd. I don't know how they found all of you and got you there. I hope we have fed you <laughs> down there. I think we did Uber Eats or something, or maybe Einstein bagels. But uh, it's good to be with all of you. So you've just heard uh, Dom share a little bit of the findings and then my own commentary. So let me give you guys the first hit. Do you have any comment or question uh, that you'd like to pose? Raise your hand. Yes. Uh, third row and tell us who you are. Um, 
Hi, uh, my name is Daniela Mulet. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that religion is still a very important uh, factor for young Arabs. So I wanted to know why you think uh, more young Arabs are pushing for their government to make a split between government and religion, and why you think this split is happening, or if it could ever happen in the nearby future. Thank you. That's great. So sort of separation of church and state. Dom, thoughts? Uh, I mean, the finding is there that like while religion is still very central to their identity, they don't want religious institutions uh, to you know, dictate all the things in their daily lives. Uh, so that, that is, but uh, it's but more isn't it, isn't it, I mean, look, I, want, I don't want to speak to you, and I don't want to put shame or any of the government types on it, but I mean, there are a lot of other folks. I've got a friend from, you know, I think, oh, you're from Doha, right? You're, you know, we're talking about the other side, but yeah. But you know, but I think, I think the, the broad thing is whether or not, uh, to this point, we had a person at our working summit where your colleague Sunil John spoke, and, and I tweeted out his clip. It was an off the record moment, but he let me put this video thing I took of him secretly. Uh, but he, he gave me approval, he gave me approval. But, but in it he said, in Beirut right now, the imams and the Christian ministers have joined hands, joined the students, and are saying themselves they want less sectarian messing around with their countries. So I just want to put that on the table because that's, that's a kind of harsher view of what you just said. Is that fair? Fair. Yep. I interrupt a lot. No. Yeah, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, great, great. So I think, I think it's a real thing, and that's, uh, where is uh, Antun? Is he still here? Where? Oh, yeah. So Antun, is that, Antun is, uh, so tell us about your, uh, you know, leading the protests in Lebanon right now. Yeah. So um, there's a few of us here. There's a few of us from the D.C. Lebanon protest kind of contingent here. Um, yeah, so definitely there is, I think in the piece that I wrote in The Hill yesterday, um, there's a specific line that I put in there that I think is very pertinent to what's happening both in Iraq um, and in Lebanon, but speaks to everything and everyone in the region, it, Egypt, Tunisia. And that is that, um, you know, the basic human need for a dignified life, food, water, electricity, just the basic things in life kind of like outweigh all the kind of sectarian identities that are important, but I mean, they're not the most important when it comes down to the basic necessities in life. And so I guess the point that I was trying to make was that the US has often crafted and viewed the region only through sectarian lenses and kind of missed opportunities to really kind of craft policies that might actually advance US interests by having a stable region. Mm. Just by looking at the basic solutions, which are just improving governance, supporting kind of basic reforms, prioritizing economic reforms over security interests, for example. Um, so that's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty great. much. That's great. That's, that, that's very helpful. And I think that helps respond to our friend in Miami. Let me take another question from Miami. Has anybody uh, got a zinger for me? Yes, uh, front row red shirt. Hi, hi. everyone. You don't have to stand. Yeah, hi. So my name is Ronald Lamb. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a st honor student here at the Padron campus in Miami Day College. And my question is, is there, since there is so much approval from, from the youth that they want to separate the, the government and the religious institutions, are, are there any initiatives taking place that are known uh, as an, an a step to, to make this, this separation? Thoughts, Tom? There are some, there are some initiatives to move, but I think we should be clear that it, they're not asking to completely separate right. uh, religion uh, and state, but there obviously some countries are moving a little bit more in that direction. Um, but yeah, it's it's not that they don't want religion uh, and religious institutions in their lives at all. No, I think that's right. I mean, we can uh, make a mistake of overstating uh, the religious dimension here, which we shouldn't do either. That really, if you go through the region, it's just it's just different. It's also different exactly. based on socioeconomic class. It's different in different areas. But the way I've been, what I have noticed, and, and again, uh, you know, Steve Clemens, not the BCW study, but Steve Clemens' experience was that I would meet people who wanted to have better jobs, better opportunity, travel, less constrictions, and saw they wanted to have a religion and faith experience that opened up opportunity, didn't close it. 
And that's the biggest thing I would hear from people. And so that's what jived with that. So it's not getting rid of it. It's having something that worked with opportunity, not worked against opportunity. Exactly. And just very quickly, yeah. if, we, if we look what's happening in the region right now, it's not driven by religion. It's driven by economic factors. Uh, and they're looking for the government, as our study is showing that, to really deliver. And that puts enormous pressure on governments to deliver in terms of economic and safety. And if the governments are unable to deliver, that's then, you know, you, you see what's happening in Beirut, uh, people protesting in Iraq and elsewhere. So it's less religion, let's say the separation between uh, religion and state is not necessarily Let me go to my friend Mal Malak here for a minute. Malak, you're fun. Um, and and uh, you were an attache for the GCC, right? You're a consultant now. And I just, because I don't know the answer to this, um, you've heard this study now a couple of times. You've taken part in a couple of the roundtables I've done. What do you think of it? And, and you know, given your role in the GCC, which frankly has money more than the other parts, does money make a difference? Yeah, um, so I'll go back to the topic we were discussing about religion. I'd add to, as you said, it's more of like having religion give you more freedom and give you more values of security and it's uh, not to use religion as a way to politicize and control like people. Um, I think it's more of that than anything. And what about the economic side of the equation? So I'd say I can speak only for people from like my generation. It, it's as of course like the number one worry is always it's like how can I get a job? How can I provide for my future family? You're so accustomed to a, being raised in a very wealthy kind of state, which is not now a luxury everybody can afford. So you'd see before where it's like one income household was such a possibility. Now it's not a possibility if you want to sustain or even just strive closer to the kind of values and comforts you grew up knowing. Before, before I move on from you, and everybody else can you know, participate, this is going to go on this morning, and we've got uh, a special guest arriving in a few minutes, and so we're going to keep you know, keeping Dom on stage, and I uh, uh, hope you're enjoying yourself yeah. up there. Uh, but, but last night, some of you may have been at the Middle East Institute Gala dinner, totally blown away by the appearance of Nadine Lebecki. L uh, Nadine is uh, an incredible film director and producer. She had an Oscar-nominated film this last year for Best Foreign Film called Capernaum. Uh, blew me away. I hadn't seen the film, but I've since seen lots of it last night because I became obsessed. <clears throat> so she's a profound artist, very successful, and commented last night about what needs to happen now in Lebanon. Uh, separate from that, another Beirut-born person yesterday was announced as the next editor of the Financial Times, Rula Kalaf. A uh, huge, huge gain. Now, now Rula was uh, Middle East editor, North, North Africa editor, then Middle East editor, then deputy editor, or foreign editor, deputy editor. So she worked up the, the system. But, but to, to have the first female editor, top editor of the Financial Times is a huge deal from the Middle East. And I'm interested in whether you see, as I wasn't able to, to sort of see this in the data as much, there are differences between men and women's perspectives, which we didn't get into. But I am interested in whether in women feel like th the situation is tilting in a more positive way for them, or they feel completely frustrated and stagnant in the situation. But Mal Malik, I'm going to give you the ability to tell us. Uh, um, it's definitely going in a positive direction, uh, whereas uh, I can speak personally from my experience. Many people always ask, how do you feel like a woman that grew up in the Gulf, and were you empowered? I, I'd say. I was always more pushed to take a greater role just to show that this has been something that has been happening, but not very yet, I would say, perceived in a very balanced way. Do we still have our Miami friends with us? Yeah. Hey. Okay, hi. Uh, back to you. Yeah, don't disappear on me. Uh, yeah, uh, to, the, to the right, the, the woman in yellow. Oh, hi. I'm hi. Sarah. I'm a veteran. I served some time over in the Middle East from um, the UAE at Dubai and also in Kuwait. And while I was there, I noticed that there, there is a shift happening within the culture. But my question is, is while we see that shift going where women are able to be more free and do more um, stuff that they previously wasn't allowed to. Going back to the original question of religion, 
do we see that because of the religion have so much restriction on who's allowed to do what? Would that shift change to where now it opens up more opportunities for people, um, for women, for, as we see here in the U.S., we have the different racial, not racial, sexual um, demographics that are changing. Will the switch or I guess the shift of the religion therefore lead to the change that is needed for those other things that we see now in the U.S. as we take that shift of opening up those various doors to happen in the Middle East? Let me ask somebody in the audience. Who's from the, in the region who wants to respond to that? The tech you Are you from the region? Okay, I, I never, okay. Uh, well, well I'll, I'll come right back to you. I What's I that? Uh, yeah, oh, yes. Ha Hamza. Hazami. Hazami and I, so can I tell our story? So I was literally flying back from uh, UAE uh, two days ago. I got back the night before last, so I'm barely awake right now. I need coffee. Uh, and I recognized Hazami from something we had done. I had met you long, long ago, and, and, and she was just there. And this person does an incredible job working on economic policy and really is someone who understands how hard it is for people to uh, be told to take risks, innovate, and do things when it could be profoundly uh, consequential to their lives. So anyway, I just saw her in the plane and she came this morning and I'm so grateful, so it's really nice. So yeah, can you respond to this yeah. question on whether the tectonic shift in you know, attitudes on religion lead to other possibilities? Uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. And uh, as someone who's very passionate about both culture and religion, I think there's something really important that we need to differentiate. And I don't know to what degree your survey goes into this, but the politicization of Islam, um, I think, is important to understand because there's a cultural aspect to how the religion is not only perceived but practiced. And you brought up the social economic uh, realities where we do know that more conservative communities tend to be more culturally conservative versus religiously conservative. So to answer the question also that the young lady posed, um, it also frames kind of that, that, that religion prescribes kind of how women should be treated. We know a lot of the treatment of women, whether it's women allow being allowed to drive or various other kind of policy changes that very desperately need to happen in the region are actually nothing to do with the actual nature of the religion itself. So I think it's really important for us as we have these conversations to start to differentiate between the political aspects, the economic aspects, the social and cultural aspects, mm -hmm. and the religion in and of itself. And I would say as someone who works very actively in the Middle East and on um, advancement, there are more women entrepreneurs and more innovation happening among women than I have actually seen in Silicon Valley in the United States where we're still fighting very hard for equity uh, gender equity across the board. Uh, if you look at Silicon Valley, majority of the founders are, are men. There's still a lot of conversations in the United States as whether a woman is even fit for office um, at the presidential level, regardless of your political views, where we have Muslim majority countries who've had women in prime minister positions and it, having really um, solid economic positions in, in government and elsewise for decades. So I think it's important for us to challenge ourselves on our perspectives as we start to, to look at aspirations of Arab youth because we're also unintentionally binding them in these false dichotomies that, that I don't actually think represent the reality on, on the ground that many Arab women feel empowered by. So before you give up the mic, um, you and I had a conversation on the plane, uh, <laughs> as I remembered, or maybe it was in the passport line, I can't remember. Uh, but but the 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 question I have is when you talk to these entrepreneurs and you see them, and I know you were just coming back from Egypt, right? So in, when you kind of go and you sort of look at that, what don't they have today that they need to succeed? Yeah, and it, it was a very fascinating conversation. So I just returned from the Startups Without Borders Summit, uh, which took place in Cairo, sponsored by several UN agencies and the American University of Cairo. And some of the conversations that we were having is lack of ecosystems. It's lack of um, cultural and kind of social norms around the idea of failing. And you mentioned something really important. It's so easy for us to kind of apply this, um, this self-fulfilled prophecy, I would say, or this hat of we can go and become the saviors of the region through innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm. But when you're having, when you have societies that have failed fiscal policies and policies that don't enable young people to actually take risks, 
um, because as you mentioned, if you default on a loan in majority of the Arab countries, uh, it's jailable. Uh, you see uh, you know, organizations like Kiva.org, which are doing fantastic work with microloans, but because of fiscal regulations, can't operate in a majority of the Middle East. So I think, again, as important it is for us to advocate. Is there a list where they can operate and can't operate? There is. I believe in lists, right? Yes, so there, you can there do actually the, is, yeah. So who are the worst countries? Uh, no comment, oh. uh, <laughs> because a lot of those policies are actually driven by the United States, too. I mean, uh. if you look at... Uh, you know, how, you know, I worked on PayPal, for example, when you wanted to do a donation to Syrian right. refugee NGOs registered in the United States, so these are U.S.-based 501c3s, if you mention the word Syria in your transaction, it gets blocked by PayPal. Uh. So I think the political, the policy misunderstandings are also driven by U.S. companies, they're driven by the international fiscal ecosystem, which is really confused. So I know the CEO of PayPal. Is that a bad thing you no, want to tell him? No, you need to advocate that yeah, he yeah, needs to do me, better. Tell me, yeah, tell me. Yeah, they need tell to me do we better. can make this an action for yeah, him here. So uh, I should tell Dan Schulman what should happen? Yeah, because you're penalizing Syrians the around word the world. Syria, so if we get the yeah. word, as a result of this event, we'll succeed this event if we get the word, if we... If, if, Syria, yeah. if mentioning Syria is okay. Or, or any countries yeah. that you, the U.S. perceives to be kind of the, the no-no countries right, that, I'll are, work that, on that it. are upsetting us. Um, and on that, I'll, uh, since I have the mic, I'm going to steal the opportunity, if you don't mind, to just mention, I am a little troubled by your framing of the United States uh, as the opposite of ally as enemy, and I know you, you mentioned that. It's a very leading, as someone who's also spent a lot of time doing surveys in the past, mm -hmm. when you lead that with that false dichotomy, it is a false dichotomy because the opposite of ally is not enemy defined, it's not d defined as such. And so that, that framing, then that sound bite and that data gets then utilized to then uh, become kind of a talking piece on other issues. And it starts to reinforce this dichotomy that the region perceives itself to be kind of this outside uh, entity and, and there's this like false duality. And I think that's a duality that we need to work really hard to continue to overcome because there is a lot of opportunity for partnerships, but these dichotomies don't really help us uh, as we start to think about progress, not only in the region, but in the United States. Dom, do you want to respond sure. to that challenge? Sure, very quickly. Uh, I think it's a fair <laughs> point, um, but that's why we're really drawing the point about the distinction between the foreign policy of U.S. versus the cultural and how they see U.S. as a country and what, you know, ideals U.S. lives up to, that it's still one of, they view it as a, you know, a top country to live in and a mm -hmm. top country to emulate. Uh, so it's, uh, it, they, they are able to draw a distinction. And just very quickly on the gender stuff, so it's not in this year's study, but previously we have included and we uh, tested this that while a majority uh, of people say that uh, Arab leaders should do more to improve rights of women, the agreement is the same among men and women. So it's not just that women want right. that, also men want it. And a couple of years ago, then uh, Saudi Arabia passed uh, allowed for women to drive. We actually tested that in our survey, and we saw that the opposition in Saudi Arabia itself was higher among women than men. So it's less about gender, it's more about the cultural uh, aspect sometimes. I think we have like another minute or two. Gentlemen, blue tie, second row, I didn't get to you before. You see me? Oh, yes. Yeah, there yeah. you are. Tell yes. us who you are. Well, Are you guys enjoying the Miami crowd? It's kind of cool, huh? Yeah. Thank you. These are great questions. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I wanted to ask specifically, um, the previous speaker talked about the brain drain that's, ha that's happening in that country because a lot of the, a lot of like the premise of us, of us like being able to foreign investment is to take the top level talent out of that country. And I know that that's like a lot of the angle that we um, as the United States sees the op sees opportunity in investing in these other countries, is to like take their great ideas it, um, and like use it here. So how, how do you how do you how do you um, I guess like address um, how do you address like the the Arabs use individual goals to leave the country versus staying there and making it better? Because in order to like to to stabilize the region, they need to stay in their country if they are top level talent. Um, differing from their goal, the, the individual goal. So I guess like if you had to ask, uh, to answer the question, um, but what are the individual goals of Arab youth um, in terms of staying in the country versus leaving? Um, if they are the, the um, you know, the, the top level um, entrepreneurs that we believe them to be. Great, do they stay or do they go? Sure, uh, I mean, the question, do they say or do they go? Short form. Uh, yep, yeah. in, in a lot of countries, uh, youth unemployment is 30%. 
So for a lot of them, it's not a choice, it's, it's more of a necessity. But I think for the region itself, in terms of, uh, is a good thing that there are countries in, within the region that young Arabs can go to. And for example, you know, in UAE, there are a lot of expats from right. Egypt, Lebanon, they go back to their countries, they still keep the connection, the cultural connection, their families, and they send money back. So it's not as, you know, they leave and never come back to the region. You know, Dom, I say this about my best friends sometimes, you did so much better than I expected. Uh, thank you so much. No, I'm just, just, Dom, thank you so much. From BCW, thank you for sharing this. Where can they get the information uh, to, so that they go, can go deeper? Yep. Because there's a very long form of this report that I spent a long air, airplane ride reading, and it is fascinating when you get into the country breakdowns and you get into the gender breakdowns. Uh, and so there is a place they can get this material, right? Yes, uh, ArabYouthSurvey.com. Uh, so you can find the full report. So every year we invite uh, commentary from experts. So we have commentary on religion, on some of these findings. We usually leave commentary to other people. Uh, so yes, you can yeah. find it there in all 11 years. And you're going to oh. stay and have coffee and sure. more rolls. OK, you're welcome. The, your, your bill's on me, OK? Sure. Uh, thank you for doing this. And with my team, if anybody's up here can, can bring, uh, we have a special guest, uh, Congressman Ro Khanna. Thank you for dropping by. Thank you, sir. I need coffee So uh, and some rolls for my other guests. So what, let me tell you what we're doing. So what I, I wanted to do today, uh, and I'm trying, uh, is to have more of a conversation in this full room. Uh, and the congressman is a friend of mine. Uh, he is, of course, a member of the Oversight Committee, the Budget Committee, the Armed Services Committee. Uh, you lead um, the, or your assistant whip for the Democratic Caucus and uh, uh, chair of the pro Progressive. You're, he's cool. But we were in Lisbon <laughs> recently, uh, and I, I lassoed him this for this. And I said, you know, <clears throat> my big itch in this topic is when we look at what Arab youth, this isn't just broadcasting what BCW said. I'm interested in why this should matter to Americans. I mean, we should uh, be looking at this because we've had big national security commitments when we weren't paying attention to these are areas before. So I wanted to have a conversation with the Congressman. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. I brought some youth up here, and we're on oh, the great. screen. Well, they keep disappearing. But we have <clears throat> 15 students from all different backgrounds uh, from Miami-Dade College who have just joined Fantastic. us by video, and they've been very active. So uh, thank you all. And we're going to have a conversation with uh, Ro Khanna. Uh, from California, and we're going to do this. And I want to just start with something. I just read a profile of you. I probably should get rid of this mic. Um, yes, me and you hold the mic. Um, you were def described as someone when you challenged, I guess, Tom Lantos. Oh, back. Yeah, way back when. Yeah. Tom, I knew Congressman Lantos. And you uh, lost against Tom Lantos, yep. but he thought you were a cool guy. <laughs> Uh, and so he went to Nancy Pelosi and said, watch this guy, you know, right. help, him, help him, you know, come along. And, and I, I guess you were described as someone who simultaneously runs to the establishment and then tries to overthrow it. <laughs> and so to me, you sounded a little bit like Beirut. Um, uh, so I'm interested, you know, when it comes, because, you know, we're doing this at a moment that's historic, where right. lots of people around the Middle East, not just in Lebanon, but others, are very dissatisfied with their circumstances. You were dissatisfied. So I'm just interested for a moment before we get into kind of the politics of the day and what you think about impeachment yeah. and all those things, about youth and activism and how you got into this yeah. and how you blend those issues of either being with the establishment or challenging it. Well, first of all, I'd say for all our flaws in our country, and I didn't know that this was going to be on the day the impeachment proceedings begin, so I'd say... I uh, did. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this country remains the most open political process in the world. And, uh, of course, my story in part is that. An uh, Indian American born in Philadelphia in 1976 or bicentenary of Hindu faith, elected to represent arguably the, the most economically powerful district in the nation at the age of 40. So I appreciate the, 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 the Barut analogy, but we have a lot of advantages in this nation of r the rule of law, institutional democracy, free markets, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, talent acquisition from around the world. And in this country, I think youth and, and, and the questioning of political culture is part of what makes us extraordinary. Uh, there is a, uh, a combination of uh, great confidence in our nation and also a great paranoia. And the great paranoia is always wondering, what could we be doing better? And I think young people are questioning 
uh, assumptions, but within the context of an extraordinary political culture. And so for me, uh, it was about questioning our uh, adventurism into Iraq and uh, military adventurism. But nothing I've said is original when John Quincy Adams made probably many of the similar points in the 1820s, that we ought to be speak, standing up for freedom, uh, for uh, our values, but doesn't mean that we go try to shape societies militarily. In short form, what I understand at the aggregate level, you know, I always have to worry about aggregate data, but, but what I see in these area view surveys is they want mod modern opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, and you come from an area that has defined what modern opportunity means. I mean, Silicon Valley is, is the way we dream. When you think about the word aspiration, which we uh, put in this, I mean, you guys have become the aspiration for much a part of the world. We were both together. Has anybody ever attended the Web Summit? Has to be somebody here. Michael. Yeah, it's one person. So I'm so surprised because 70,000 people migrate to Lisbon every year for this crazy yeah. conference. It's, it's about the size. Imagine the largest airport hangar that you could imagine times 10. Uh, and that's how big this, this forum is. And we were both there together. Um, and so you're meeting essentially the talent, the people that are right. thinking about this. So from your perspective, I mean, because you live in this world, and, and, I, and I know that you're not a so-called Middle East person, right. but when you look at youth from that part of the yeah. world, what can they best do to get where you're at? Well, it's very encouraging to see that uh, they have many of the same uh, aspirations that uh, people anywhere in the world is, uh, do, which is to have a good paying job, to, have, uh, to be an entrepreneur, start a business, to uh, want to make a contribution uh, to their country or their or, or to the world. Technology does several things. One, it diffuses opportunity. So now you literally can be anywhere in the world and potentially have an opportunity to work for a company anywhere mm. in the world. Uh, it also, at its best, uh, diffuses capital to uh, uh, p places where uh, a talent uh, exists. And so I, I have always felt one of the things that I was very impressed with in my district. There was Erwin Fetterman, who was the US venture partner uh, and was very involved in providing venture capital to Palestinian youth uh, for startups. And his belief in his small way is that this is ultimately what's going to lead towards greater peace in that area. Uh, and you know, the, there are a lot of negatives, of course, to uh, the technology revolution. I mean, we've seen that in terms of uh, false speech or hate speech. We've seen that in terms of concentration of wealth. But done right, the positive of the technology revolution is that it can empower uh, individuals in extraordinary ways and, and encourage uh, economic growth in ways that haven't happened and uh, shape a more peaceful 21st century. You know, uh, I want to come to some of my friends on stage here. So Yasmin, get ready. Yasmin's a very cool student at Georgetown University. Wonderful. And she is co-president of the Arab Society. I called them out of the blue, and I just said, look, I'm at the Hill. I want to know you guys, and you delivered. So thank you. Um, and I guess I want to ask the, the, the question about youth in America yeah. and, and what they're feeling. And, and from a congressional, I mean, I'm going to ask you just a loaded question here. From your Republican colleagues, your yeah. Democratic colleagues, what's your literacy on all this stuff? On technology. On youth. On youth. Well, we could probably do a lot better. But the youth could do maybe a little bit better in uh, understanding and appreciating uh, uh, the sacrifices of previous generations. I mm. think it's both ways. You know, I had someone uh, in one of my town halls come up and say, well, what are you going to tell my 18-year-old why uh, she should stay involved, given the mess it is in Washington? And I said, well, one of my colleagues, John Lewis, was beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge so people could have a right to vote. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, who have made extraordinary sacrifices for the, so that the country can be where it is. I think young people, uh, and, and we all could learn more, are leading the way on climate change, are leading the way on uh, the gun violence epidemic, are leading the way on standing up for human rights uh, ar around the world and having greater empathy. Uh, but I think that there is a, a lack of um, the dialogue between generations could improve. Uh, a sense of what young people have to there and here. There yeah. and here. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about impeachment? Well, I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming, and uh, where uh, you know many people will get to see it today with Ambassador Taylor. Right. Uh, but you know, I mean, for me, it's very simple. It, it just comes down to why is the word Biden there so many times? Mm -hmm. And I'm not even supporting the vice president, but you know, when it comes to all of the other explanations, who are you? Oh, you're a Bernie guy. I'm. A, I'm, I'm yeah, from how's Bernie, he doing? 
He's doing well. Yeah. I mean, it's at the races, I think, down to him and Warren and Biden. And Buttigieg is uh, had, a, had, a, had a rise. So uh -huh. uh, we'll see how, how it shakes out. But, you know, I mean, why? Okay, if you're going after corruption, if you're going after uh, at foreign policy objectives, fine. But it just defies uh, logic that you would continually focus on Joe Biden, who happens to be the person beating you in the polls uh, all summer. And then it's not just one phone call. It's 15, 20 people. What surprised me is I didn't know that many people listen in on a president's phone call. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you'd think, just out of common sense, you know, if you have 25 people listening in on something, you'd be careful. But, uh, you know, not this Well, president. I needed to ask that. But, you know, I, I'm interested, you know, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the broad side of young people. And, yes, me, I am, I am going to come to you next. But, but uh, you know, our responsibilities to try to uh, demonstrate, because I'm very conscious that we're in Washington, and, and Washington is sort of a performance stage yeah. for the rest of the world and the rest of the country. You know, what our responsibilities are to sort of fix infrastructure, to address civil justice, civil rights, uh, uh, to get educational opportunities out there, all the other kinds. Because when I read the, the youth study that we just profiled, wow. all of these are, most of them are policy subjects that you could move the needle with smarter approaches. So in your role, because I know I, you know, I, I am, admittedly a fan of what you, you've been trying to do, but are some of these issues that like impeachment a distraction from fundamentally moving the needle on investing in some of the real problems this country has? Well, impeachment is a responsibility. We have to stand up for our Constitution and we have to stand up for the oath of office. Uh, that the rule of law underpins everything else in this country. It's our, I would argue, our biggest comparative advantage is strong institutions, strong rule of law. That said, I, I do think one of the missed opportunities over the last uh, few years is a focus on what it's going to take to have American leadership in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And these aren't complex ideas. We know that an infrastructure investment in this country, including the smart grid and broadband, would create 3.5% economic growth. That's according to the American Society right. of Engineers, and 3 million jobs. And yet we haven't been able to do that. We know we need... Uh, affordable broadband in every part of the country. China is doing that. We know we need investment in artificial intelligence and quantum computing, that we have to lead in the technologies of, of the future. I was, right. we saw uh, Prime Minister Blair there, I was joking, I said, you know, America uh, had, a bunch, had some industrial espionage from the British when we got the power loom to get us started. Uh, so the idea that we're going to be able to just protect our technology, though important, mm. and I support that, that against China, uh, it, it's not sufficient. We have to be leading in the future. We have to make sure the best and brightest are coming here, that we're investing in the new technologies. And there seems to be an, an inability for America to have uh, a strategic vision devoid of partisan politics, where you have China having a 2025 strategy. What is America's 2025 strategy? Are you going to run for president someday? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yasmin, what, what question do you have for Congressman Khanna? It will be. Great. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I was just wondering, like at Arab Society, we really try and engage with more Georgetown students not from the region to become interested in like what the Arab youth and Arab culture have to say. And for the mm. most part, on the local level, it's really positive. But what would you say is something that you would want to do to incentivize Americans to be more interested in the youth abroad, whether that's in Latin America or the Arab world? Anywhere outside yeah. the country. You know, it's a, uh, a, a challenge. I mean, one of the great, my grandfather spent f four years in jail against, uh, with Gandhi uh, in, in the challenge against British colonialism. But because the British were- Do you have pictures? Uh, I, uh, I do. That'd be really cool. I do. Will you share them with us sometime? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, happy that'd be to. great. I'll I'm send them up to. That'd be, that's worth sure, sharing. We, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, yeah. Gandhi but, photos. But, but one of the, the, the I, and obviously I thought col colonialism was, was a, a terrible sin, and, and America has been far more restrained. But one of the things that uh, it did is give people an interest in the rest of the world, and we have not had uh, the same necessity to engage in the world. And I think that that's to our, uh, to our detriment. We have to understand that in an economy that 95% of consumers are overseas, in a time where the world is far more interconnected, uh, having an outlook and understanding of, of the world is, is going to be much more important. And so that starts, I think, in uh, preschool and goes up through K through 12 education uh, and understanding the, that 
Actually, that's what America is going to need to compete in the 21st century against 1.2 billion people, and uh, and and the Arab youth are going to be an extraordinary part of part Let of. Let me that. ask one of our uh, who's got the best question in Miami. <laughs> Comment question from our folks in Miami. Questions, anyone? Not yet. No questions so far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just going to pick the front guy, long hair. Uh, yeah, that's you. Yeah, right, right, yeah, the front row. But give give us your thought for the congressman before we go. Well, my congressman, um, uh, wow. Actually, I have a, I wanted to uh, ask, like, the lady that, that said about the, um, in fact, about the, um, uh, how, how Latin American countries could uh, could um, get interested in in, uh, in, the Arab, in the Arab dilemma. If if I could make a comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So actually, um, I, I'm from Guatemala, and I got interested in um, I got interested in something that's happening right now in Venezuela, and because of that, we created an initiative called Benexoro, and you can follow us in the, at Benexoro. Uh, on Instagram or your website, uh, or, or you know, your social media. And I think that one of the things that inspired me the most of, of finding like uh, common ground with this, uh, with, with Venezuelans, was finding like friends in common, right? And I think that here in, in Miami, I haven't, I haven't had like the opportunity to meet, to have like, um, to learn more uh, about the, about, the, uh, about the Arabic countries and, um, you know the, the Middle East, and I think uh, that's that's why I'm here in the in this uh, in this conversation. Well, that's this, uh, that that that's powerful. that's great. So what I think I'm hearing from you is that while you're meeting lots of different folks and culture down there, you're not having much exposure to the Arab uh, Arab society questions going on. I'll fix that for you later. Um, Thank you. Steve. You know, so we'll fix that for you later. You know, one of the things that I want to put on the table is when we began this project. And I began reaching out, and I really reached out with a preference. I wanted to find, you know, smart women like Aliyah up here and Malak and Yasmin, because I thought it would be hard to find them. It's not. There are Arab women throughout U.S. universities that are incredible. What's harder to find, frankly, are the guys. Uh, so where's Manir? Manir's here. Uh, uh, Alexander, you're up here, you know, just because you're friends of them. Uh, but but you know, I, I think. But what I found is I, there's a huge national network of Arab talent in U.S. universities throughout the country, uh, and it's overwhelmingly positive. So we can uh, fix that for you. But I do want to ask um, Congressman Connor for a minute, really about race, ethnic division, and the fact, I mean, th what you're asking is a, is a fascinating question. I want to take an element deeper, which is uh, we live in bubbles. We live in bubbles that self-reinforce views and attitudes we have. We live in bubbles. If you're a conservative reader, I have a friend who's a conservative publisher in the room. You know, he, he, he could publish a book, and he knew that a certain circle of people would buy that book because they were conservatives. If you have a progressive, you're the really progressive caucus. You know, Amazon can predict which books those people will buy. Right. So how do we break through those bubbles, ethnic bubbles, class bubbles? You know, because it affects lots of things. It affects you know our our availability of resources, of health, of uh, educational opportunity. We met, uh, I met yesterday a woman named Abrar Omesh, who is the youngest uh, person to win office in uh, Virginia. She just won a seat on the Fairfax School Board. She's the granddaughter of Libyan immigrants. And I said, why did you get into this? Are you, you know, uh, upset with President Trump? She said, no. I said, what I'm uh, uh, driven by was the disparities in opportunity for kids at preschool. And that, she became obsessed. And so as these these positions are distributed, they're going to people who are connected and wealthy and not to people who are sort of underrepresented. And that's what drove her to do this. So yeah. I'm interested in that because I know that's in part what drove some of why you got into your business. And then we'll finish there. Well, that's the challenge uh, of our time. I mean, I'm, I go back to uh, two things. One, Lincoln in 1858 gave a speech about July 4th, which is one of his, it, it's not much widely read, but it's one of his brilliant speech. And I often say that it's the two pages he writes have more value than the collective Twitter of the entire Congress or every American mm -hmm. politician. And it, Lincoln is going through having to have a very difficult question, which is how are the French and Germans really going to be American? Because back in the 1850s, to be American, you had to be able to trace your heritage 
uh, back to the founding. Mm. And that if you couldn't trace your heritage back to the founding, then you weren't really an American. That's what it meant to be an American. And so Lincoln is grappling with these recent immigrants. And of course, that's where he says that uh, there's an electric cord that runs through the heart uh, of any person who believes in the Declaration of Independence and Constitution. And if you believe in those documents, you're flesh of the flesh and blood of the blood of our founders. And that we are really based on a uh, political uh, uh, religion, not a, a national, ethnic, or um, a particular denominational religion. And somehow we have to get back to, 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 to that ethos. I believe the reason our politics are so difficult today is because what we're trying to do is so difficult. We've ne there has never been in the history of this world a truly multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic democracy. And to think that there would be a linear line from Obama to that future when it hasn't happened in the history of humanity, I think is naive. Hmm. And so what we're trying to do is America is going to be America's great contribution to the world. And Lincoln's second inaugural, of course, he ends with, well, if we can do this, there's going to be a just and lasting peace. And the reason I actually believe that is, think about it. Now you have someone from Guatemala who's aware of our history with the United Fruit Company and what we did in Guatemala, not a, po not a positive chapter in American history, uh, or what we've done in other parts of the country, some, some great things. Freeing, uh, freedom of, freeing uh, the people from tyranny, winning the Cold War, but some not so great things. But now you're gonna have people from every part of the world in this country shaping a common uh, future for a better, uh, better 21st century. That's an extraordinary opportunity. I, I am 100% convinced it will be our greatest chapter in American history, but the pains of getting there is gonna be difficult. And the, the, what I will end and say is, um, and this is not, I, I, I like uh, Andrew Yang, but by, by one thing which, which I think is very challenging is he's often paints a dystopian vision of the future. And if you believe as I do that the simple question with the president, when you put everything else aside, is do you believe in the past or do you believe in the future? That is the simple question. See, Donald Trump is going and he's saying, you've lost plant after plant. You've had shutdowns. Your parents, your grandparents fought in the wars. Rose family, they just got here in the 1960s. All these other people, they're doing really well. What happened to you? You built America. I'm gonna get you that America back. And our only response, I believe, our response to get to this multicultural, multi-religious future the, the, the one Lincoln talked about, we've got to convince people that the future is going to be better, mm. that they're going to have more jobs, more opportunity, more possibility, more ability to, to, to interact uh, with companies and make money and be part of the world than ever before. And I believe if we convince people, which we will, that the future will be better, then we will usher in uh, a, a amazing era in America where we will vindicate what Lincoln believed in and we will be uh, truly a, a, a beacon for human rights and, uh, and peace around the world. I think that's the great possibility. Well, with that, I want to thank you, Ro. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really happy uh, that you challenged Tom Lantos <laughs> and he said, hey, you know, you ought to get into this business, kid. Uh, so, Congressman Conner, thank, thank you. you very, very thank much. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you for this your This is work. Alexander. This is Malak. Thanks. This is, you should say hi to these folks. Here I would love with to. The Aaliyah. Uh, and thank you for thank spending you. some time thank with us. This is a, this a great moment. Thank so you. So we're going to now, uh, thank where's you. Voice of God? I keep talking about God. Thank God's you, Congressman. Thank you. Our okay, next Ro, conversation you, focuses on thought leaders with a truly global perspective on the Arab youth community. Please welcome Kush Choksi, Senior Vice President of Middle East and Turkey Affairs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Steve Culberson, President and CEO at Youth Service America. Dr. Nicole Golden, Senior hey, Fellow you? at the Atlantic no, no, Council, no. and joining us via video, Kim Hildes, Don't. Scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And yep, Steve, back to you. Okay, great. Apparently, um, I'm doing it wrong. Are you guys having fun? This is like a cafe. You know, you don't ever, you don't ever know what's going on. Yes, we need mics, right? So you stole my two best uh, stage presence people. Okay, they, they bring them back. Hey, how are you? Come on right, in, just have a seat. Just yeah. Yeah, join up here. I, um, we'll get you some coffee and rolls yeah, uh, a little bit. Yeah, th so what, what I thought we would do, in, and I think it's important, uh, again, to look at 
the broad question of youth everywhere. And so we've got three, four, oh, hey, Kim got us. Uh, Kim Hi. is no longer a journalist. Give her a round of applause for leaving journalism. Uh, Kim, many of you know, was a Middle East correspondent uh, uh, for BBC and, and, and covered politics in BC, covered Hillary Clinton, wrote one of the best books on Hillary Clinton out there, The Secretary. I think movies are being based on it. Uh, so Kim, but Kim is now uh, at the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, and she so wanted to join this conversation. I think you're in New York today, right, Kim? Yeah, I'm in New York, but uh, I've been living in Beirut for a while, and I can tell you all about the youth revolution that we're seeing there. So I think yeah. that's why you have me on. Yeah, well, I have you on because I like you, but I'm glad you know something <laughs> about Beirut, too. Um, so let me, let me just, just sort of open the, the, the question here, Kush. You know, we were talking just the other day about trends that you think uh, you see out there about opportunity, uh, and youth, and, and, and what are the, I guess, what are the building blocks that matter in terms of opportunity uh, and changing the game? So, Kush? Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, I think that the building blocks um, that need to be worked on in the region are, um, in a, or an Uber kind of building block would be greater private sector participation in the economy, and for the states in the region to scale back uh, to the extent possible, um, they are crowding out role in the economy um, in gradually facilitating the private sector to, to play that role. I mean, too often you see um, an overpresence of uh, government institutions in the economy. Now, is it because oil is such a big factor in some of the richer countries, or is it whether it's developed or developing, is it pretty much the same? It's pretty much the same, uh, whether it's uh, developed or developing. Um, and um, I mean, it's the same whether it's Saudi Arabia or Egypt or Jordan, um, three very different economies um, in terms of oil dependency. And you still see this, the government institutions. The and state you're at the chamber. So what, are, you, are you doing anything actively to promote this from the chamber? Yes. We have a number of different bilateral programs with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt. With, with all of the major uh, markets in the region where we are looking at facilitating business engagement between American companies and companies in the region. Both My friend ways. Hazami over here, who's just back from uh, Egypt, was saying that's one dimension. That the other dimension really is that there's not enough of a risk culture uh, that's in place. That, that's that, that, you know, I, 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 you know, not to sort of pick on the UAE, but I've been trying to convince uh, either UAE or Jordan or anyone to basically, I, I forgot to ask Rokhan if he knows Vinod Kosla, but Vinod, uh, who's a fabulous investor, mm -hmm. very famous, has this annual conference called fail.com, uh, and many of the biggest entrepreneurs that have come out, you know, some of them I shouldn't mention, like Travis Kalanick and whatnot, uh, went there, and, and because they failed multiple times and went through, and said, we need that conference in the Middle East somewhere. That would be a huge thing, Shema. You should consider doing it. You should take notes. And yeah. Of not wanting to take risks. Yeah. So you need to fix that. Yeah, so. And this is why the majority of the youth are looking towards the government to employ them. Yeah. They right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm going to just make you say it again because that was actually important and I want our Miami friends to hear it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, just go going back to the point, um, w again, uh, in, in the region generally, uh, looking at the survey. But you also said the UAE tries to avoid risk. Well, yeah. um, yes. Well, yeah. this is why majority of the people, when they when they um, graduate, uh, the first thing they do is look for a government job. Yeah. That's kind of the, uh, everyone is risk averse um, and, and this is kind of how the culture is. Um, the, this is, again, when, when we move towards the, the government is oversaturated and um, in order for us to expand the private sector and mm. diversify our economies, we need to push them towards maybe taking more risks. Um, by doing that, you need a bit of backup from, you know, top-down uh, policies as well to, to encourage the youth to go into these startups and, and develop these small, medium enterprises. And they probably need bankruptcy laws. Well, so, that's a yeah. big area that we work on, and they're absolutely right on right. that. And we're looking, and in many markets, right. we've been involved ne with establishing I, I want to go to Kim in a minute, but forward. Nicole, you are nodding, and so I want to get your take on this. And uh, Nicole, again, is with the Atlantic Council, and you've been working through the region uh, as well on, on, on youth. I mean, this is your game. So <laughs> I, I'm interested in both what you think the headlines are that we should know about, but also addressing this this question of what's bubbling in the 
hearts and minds of, of, of young people in the Middle East? Sure, well, I sort of defer to the young people of the Middle East to yeah. tell us what's really on their minds, right, in yeah. the survey. But I mean, I think in terms of the headlines, I, I would agree with what, what Kush said and picking up on why I was nodding. I think their headlines really are about starting with just the sheer demographics, right? Um, when you look around the world, um, you know, roughly 85% of the world's young people live in lower middle income countries, emerging markets. Um, and really the places that we need to think about in terms of this youth imperative for global growth, for global stability, and you know, getting to the heart of why this matters mm. for us. Um, and when looking at the headlines in the Middle East, I mean, it's, it's as true there as it is anywhere in terms of the size of the population, this youth imperative. And I often say, especially for the MENA region, is very much about the, it's not so much the next generation that we often hear people refer to as, as much as it's the now generation. Um, this is you know, more than roughly half the population under the age of 30 in most of the countries that we're talking about. And when mm -hmm. you're thinking about what those headlines are, it's about uh, the move to the private sector and the fact that you have a relatively high educated population, uh, both mm -hmm. women and men, but they don't necessarily have the jobs that they're going into. At the same time, one of the other interesting pieces that I found in the survey is that three out of four young Arabs believe that their education, they're not getting the quality education. So they're, they're getting- they're, they're pissed off they're about pissed their off. education. They're getting yeah. these degrees, but they don't think they're actually being trained or prepared for the jobs that are available. And to your point about going into that uh, into entrepreneurship, into small, medium-sized enterprise, right. because there's not enough public sector jobs. They don't feel like they have not only the support to take the risk, so whether that's the, the, the sort of social support, mm -hmm. but whether it's the entrepreneurial skills, the financing, I mean, there's lots of things right. we can talk about, the regulatory environment that doesn't necessarily support innovation, which is where you have things like the Tunisia startup law that mm -hmm. was recently passed, which is, trying to sort of help from that policy side, help kind of give that push factor so that you can get that pull factor. Um, and then, you know, I would just give a, a quick note because I heard somebody earlier talk about sort of some of the gender equality issues. Um, I think we really need to also if, think about from the economic side, the dramatically low women's and young women's economic participation. And from a headline perspective, to me, that one still really stands right, out. Right. So it's thinking about how do you uh, encourage young women to go into non-traditional sectors? How do you think about um, policy change that can really help um, get women going in the economy? Fantastic. I want to go to Kim. I'm going to yeah, come back here, but let me get our friend um, on video because I want her in the room. Uh, and I want to tell my, my lovely colleagues and friends, if anybody's walking, I mean, we were supposed to have carafes of coffee for me to be delivering to all of you, but apparently that's illegal in this building. It's soon going to be torn down. Uh, but, uh, it, but, but no, it won't be, it, it, you know, this is all, this is one of the last times you'll be able to be, be in this building. It, it's, it's going to Johns Hopkins uh, will be closed for two years. So this is a memorable moment. Just keep that in mind. But Kim got us. Uh, yeah, so if anybody brings me coffee, you'll get a gold star. Um, but Kim, are you, tell us, you know, you wrote, you, you're one of the most uh, beautiful writers I know about the currents in the Middle East that have been shaping for a long time. You know, I've been reading your, your material a lot, but, but something different seems to be happening now. I know we've said that, but it, this really feels different. You didn't hear earlier, but I was with Nadine Lebecki last night, the director of Capernaum. Yeah. Uh, room of 500 people, astonishing moment of, of humanity about you know, bonding with the folks uh, in Beirut and, and all throughout Lebanon. So give us the sense of where aspiration Frust meets frustration meets action. So I'll, I'll just comment very briefly first on what the previous speakers said, because I agree with, with everything they've said. Uh, and I think it is important to keep in mind that, you know, the, the way that the economies have been uh, run in the Middle East are a huge impediment to forward progress and to privatization, because, you know, governments still are the largest employers in most of these countries. And that is one of the reasons why there is no risk taking um, in large sectors of the economy, because it is government uh, run, it is there is a government stranglehold. I would disagree with the idea that young people are not risk takers. It's just that um, it's very hard to um, go beyond those controls that are there. But you see, for example, in Lebanon, which is not as government run when it comes to an economy, it's much more uh, freewheeling uh, with its problems. Uh, the risk takers are there, and they are 
uh, very creative, they are very entrepreneurial. You see entrepreneurship in Saudi Arabia as well, in the UAE. Egypt is much harder because of you know, the huge uh, demographic boom. But Arab youth are very creative. They're exposed to ideas from everywhere. They travel, they come back, they study abroad, they come back to their countries. They want to participate, but they also uh, are very disappointed, to Nicole's point, about the education mm. that they get in their countries because it does not prepare them for today's world. It prepares them for a world from the 50s or the 60s. So you have these three different aspects to the problem. The fact that it's still very much rentier states or government-run economies, uh, bad education and or you know not great education that doesn't prepare you for today's world, and then this issue of a demographic boom that makes everything so much harder. The aspirations that young people have, and I don't think I can speak for young people anymore, I just sort of crossed that 40-year-old barrier, but... <laughs> Uh, but I'm still, you know, I still have very uh, a lot of very young thanks friends. Thanks for your and candor. <laughs> thanks for your candor, Kim. Um, yeah. But I was on the streets of Beirut, and they are really the drivers. The young generation are really the drivers of what is happening on the streets of Beirut today and of what is happening on the streets of Iraq today because mm -hmm. these protests are not getting a lot of coverage, I think, in the U.S. because, you know, there is a lot happening here as well. But it's important to, to keep an eye because... I do think that we're at a turning point in the Middle East, and I am still very hopeful. Despite the violence that we've seen in Iraq, more than 300 protesters killed so far, and the very beginnings of some violence in Lebanon that we're seeing since yesterday, I am still hopeful. The young generation is saying, we're done. Mm -hmm. We're done with your sectarianism. We're done with your corruption. You we're done with your militias. We are done. But a very powerful message from a young student in Lebanon speaking on television in response to politicians who were saying, oh, students shouldn't be protesting, you should be studying to, pr to prepare your future. And she said, which future would you like us to prepare for? Our only option is to leave the country to find a job. And why did you, the older generation, not stand up against corruption, against sectarianism? We, as the young generation, are living with your memories, with your past wars, with your past corruption. We are done with that. So mm. I think young people in the Arab world, they want jobs. They want a better future. They don't want to emigrate if they don't have to. But most of all, they want to be heard. They want to be respected. They want to feel um, that they are part of these societies. And mm. that's why I think it's also important to look at the politics and how and how politicians deal with their, with their youth. Fantastic. Kush, I cut you off. Thank you very much. That's so powerful, Kim. I'm really grateful we tracked you down. Um, Kush, you wanted to uh, intervene here. No, I just wanted to add to the earlier point in terms of it, there's a statistic which is startling. If, when, if women and men participated equally in the economies of the Middle East, it could add about 47% of economic grain to its GDP by 2025. Um, and that would be equal to about two and a half trillion dollars in 2014 USD. Are there any countries that you're looking at now in the Middle East that are getting the equation better than others? Who's the top performers? Who are the worst performers? Um, it's difficult to, you well, know, just, rank just, all of yeah. them. But I would no, say that. No, not all of them. Just give me know, a couple of the worst that, and a couple of the best. That, that that you know, particularly in 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 some of the Gulf countries like the UAE and Qatar, you see greater levels of women participating in than in some of the other But they're economies. small. What about big countries? Well, the big countries, I mean, clearly, um, uh, you know, Egypt does have a certain level, um, but look, Saudi Arabia, um, um, Jordan, um, there's just mm. untapped potential. They have potential. Yeah. So uh, Tim, if I could just, yeah, just add ahead. one point, I think that what is also important connected to the economy is political participation. I think right. young people in the Arab world want to feel that they can have a say in their future. And that's why uh, they're protesting in Iraq and Lebanon. And that's why you do hear rumblings of discontent, even in countries like the UAE, which are, you know, uh, to Kush's point, making, you know, better uh, uh, head, um, uh, headways in terms of reforming their economy and preparing for the future. Political participation is going to be key. And that's why what's happening in Iraq and Lebanon is so important. And that's why Tunisia is a more successful example of mm. what can happen when people uh, do take to the streets and bring down the old system. We had earlier, he had to go, but we had a young entrepreneur from Tunisia here earlier 
Uh, and I didn't mean to mean say UAE was smaller. I mean, it's big, big in way. But I mean, in terms of these large-scale countries, yeah. unless you begin to see, you know, change on sort of the, the, the larger scale uh, nations, then I somehow, you know, find myself in the skeptical bin. Uh, Steve Culbertson, um, good friend. For years, we've talked about what it takes to create fabric between generations, what it takes to create fabric between youth and purpose and youth and service, and you do this globally. And the other day, we, you were at one of our working summits and you talked about empathy. Uh, and I just want to you know, give you an opportunity, Steve, to sort of share with us your observations about uh, youth in the Middle East, what's going right and what's not going right. Yeah, so I was looking at, uh, at the Lebanon protests yesterday, mm. and uh, one of the signs that I thought those signs, of course, are in English, uh, which is probably they're looking for the audience here. Uh, but it said, the power of the people is stronger than the people in power. Mm. And that was one of those hand-painted uh, signs, which I thought was wonderful. I, I think there's this incredible disconnect between what we know that works and what we know about young people and what's actually happening. And I think, you know, if, if we can figure out how to plug into these power grids, I think we can solve this relatively fast. And, and I'm very optimistic about it. I've, I've done a lot of work in, in Abu Dhabi and, and, and the Emirates over the last few years, and I'm seeing where, you know, they've just opened a youth hub, uh, had all these ministers come in. And, and uh, you know, by the way, the U.S. is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have a full-time youth minister, somebody who wakes up mm. and just thinks about young people. All these countries in the region do. And so we've got infrastructure. But, but let me talk about these two dynamics. The first one is young people themselves. And what we know biologically about young people uh, is that they're wired for three things. And this is, I don't care if you're in, in a Alabama or Abu Dhabi, it's exactly the same thing. This is human biology. Young people are wired for novelty. Mm. They see new things and they move in new directions that adults just don't see. And that's a real asset. It's an asset in the corporate world. It's an asset in social change. It's an asset in, you know, in government reform. So novelty. The second thing that goes hand in hand with that is that they're willing to take risks. Young people are wired to take risks. Adults are not. And so that risk taking, you know, no risk, no reward is critical to any advancement that human progress is going to make. And the third piece that also goes hand in hand with that is this whole idea of pure authority. So if, if you say something to me, how old are you? 21. 21. If, so this if, is Munir, by the way. Munir, Steve Culbertson. Yeah, yeah. So if, if I walk up to Munir and I said, dude, do you want to go smoke a joint afterwards? You're going to look at me like going, you're my dad's age. <laughs> this is on tape. This is right? being watched by millions of yeah, people. Yeah, well, right it's now. legal here careful. in D.C. But, you know, it, it, if, you know I'm, I'm his dad's age, right? I could have a 21-year-old son. Um, and he'd look at me and say, no, you know? But another 21-year-old comes up to him and, you know, makes a suggestion, let's go clean the beach. Huh. You know, he's much more likely to respond to that. So that pure authority goes along with the novelty right. and the risk. They're able to bring their generation along. Can we need to tap into that stuff. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I asked Munir to come up here for a reason because he, he said something very profound, which I tweeted out. He's the person I tweeted out, that, that uh, in in uh, Lebanon right now, he saw imams and Christian ministers, joint ministers joining youth and saying to the government, we don't want these sectarian games played anymore. And you right. know, kind of, I thought it was a very profound moment. And I, and I'm, I was so impressed that someone young uh, from Georgetown, and he writes a lot about religion, uh, frankly, uh, was, you know, had that view, so it was there. But you, you had said something that very profound to me the other day, which I'm gonna tweet what you said, because you gave me permission from the off the record meeting we had. Um, and, and you said that in the Middle East, where they are ahead of the United States, is that the youth are looked at as living today in the moment. And here, that's not happening yet. And do I have that right? Yeah, and, and uh, I think it goes back to Nicole's point about the, the demographics are so sort of critical you know, to, to what we're seeing there that you, know, you can't help but live in the present. You, know, you, you can't look at these young people and say, we're going to put you on hold, right. like American students are told. You are the hope of tomorrow. You right. are tomorrow's leaders. You yeah. know, if you're the hope of tomorrow, what are you today? Yeah. If you're tomorrow's leaders, what are you today? You know, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a big insult to young mm -hmm. people to tell them that they're the hope of the future. Young people don't live in the future. They live in the present. And right. just the sheer yeah. demographics, I think, are, is driving 
much more attention like this youth hub. You know, you ignore young people at your own peril. If you don't have a youth strategy, you don't have a strategy at all. We're, we're a little bit behind, and they're going to say I've got 36 seconds, but I'm going to do some quick lightning round things here and go back. Are our friends with Miami still with us, uh, Katie? Folks? Yes? No? No? Um, just for the sake of showing them later, can I just give them a round of applause? Because it was great they hung out with us so much this morning. Uh, they made luck. It was really awesome to have them. Uh, but just real quick, Malik, I, wanna, I wanted to ask you, you you're, you're one of my um, token young people here today. Uh, you're not token at all. But, but, but I, I wanna, what are our, you know, uh, part of this discussion, you know, somebody just talked about drugs, but in a positive way, kind of. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, drug use, mental health, I'm interested in the other dimensions we may not, are, are there blind spots in this conversation that, that you see that we haven't gotten to? Uh, so I would echo the risk taking and add to what Shema said, uh, another side of the conversation, whereas like government jobs were looked at as cushiony, comfortable, secure jobs, right. more and more now that like, I would not say like the leaders of tomorrow, but yeah. the leaders of now, right. uh, more youth are within the GCC, I would say sp specifically with the whole like transformational plans, for example, Saudi 2030, government jobs are no longer cushiony. They're very hard, they're no longer nine to five, they're more like nine to nine. And a lot of people are, or a lot of youth are opting to be part of government jobs because they want to have a stake and they have a responsibility mm. for shaping their future. Great, Kim, any blind spots we should be thinking about? Um, I think that, um, I just want to go back to the point that was just made about the leaders of, of tomorrow versus the leaders of today. I think that we, to con I concur, that we ignore youth at our own peril. And I think that what Lebanon's youth and Iraq's youth have proven is that this whole idea that millennials are too busy with their smartphones is wrong. They are the ones who are keeping these revolutions, these uprisings in Lebanon and Iraq today um, alive. They are the ones who are keeping it going for weeks on end and they're braving bullets and beatings to do so. I think the blind spot is to be too focused only on the economy mm -hmm. and to forget that people mm -hmm. everywhere in the Arab world, in the US, in Hong Kong, in Chile, they want dignity as well. Mm -hmm. As well as a job, they want dignity. And we ignore that as well at our peril. And it is true today across the Arab world as well. Manir, I, I, I gave you this because I want to ask you, you're, you're always thoughtful, so make this good. Um, any blind spots? Um, I would just like to point out that I'm extremely hopeful that youth in the Arab world, and especially in Lebanon where I'm from, they're finally taking their own agency into their own mm -hmm. hands. Like, believe it or not, Absolutely. the history of the Middle East has not always been as it was. Like, the past hundred years have been uh, exceptional. <laughs> uh, but they're finally reclaiming this agency, reclaiming this history, mm -hmm. and uh, they're fighting, they're pushing for a better future. Um, Yesterday, I'm not sure if you heard, but the Lebanese president addressed the Lebanese people and said, if you don't like the people in power, you can emigrate. You can leave the country, which I hope the youth continue to push. I hope that is not uh, no longer going to be the option, and I hope uh, the people will finally reclaim their country. Real quickly, you're co-president with my friend Yasmin of the Arab Society. Yes. Uh, at Georgetown, when you interact with other students that are not Arab, do you find interest there? What gets other people that are not members of the Arab society interested in Arab stuff? I mean, there's incredible interest in DC, especially at a school like Georgetown in the Middle East, whether that's for security reasons, um, or a lot of people are just uh, interested in Arab culture in general and studying the language, the arts, the history, which is extremely rich. And Don't be wrong, uh, what's the worst part of Georgetown? I mean, a lot of people are interested in the security aspects of okay. the Middle East, so, that's so that's, uh, that definitely sticks out. Okay, great. Chris, let me go to you and, and ask you, because, you know, I, I have, uh, you and I are both um, aged enough that we've seen moments like this before that have not translated mm -hmm. into real change. No, don't call me a cynic, but I did work for Richard Nixon the latter part of his life. It's a true story. But, but another time, but uh, I'm, I'm just interested in your... The, the blind spots too, but on the question of when you're actively thinking about economic empowerment and institutionalization, are there things that we should be putting on the table? And I know, Nahak, I'm gonna be leaving, but Krish is cool. Uh, yeah. Well, when you, when you say things that should be put on the table. Just fast form. Well, yeah. very quickly, I mean, the government, governments in the region seriously need to think about their overbearing role on the economy, liberalization, 
They've got to take concrete steps um, in, uh, about women participation in the economy. Right. And they've got to be cognizant of the fact that the youth in the uh, Arab world today are very aware mm -hmm. and very connected right. through smartphones as to what is happening outside of Nicole, their Nicole, blind spots? Yeah. Uh, yeah take the mic. Yeah, sure. So blind spots, definitely picking up on your point about mental health. That's a blind spot around the world and absolutely in the region as well. And then I'd say blind spot to be aware of is uh, Arab youth are not a monolith, right? We saw that coming through in the survey, so really need to be aware of that and, and inequality. Mm. Um, really thinking Super about inequality, important. whether that's a, you know uh, digital infrastructure and digital inequality, which is rising, education inequality, um, economic inequality. Alexander, you've been sitting up here great. I don't want you to be an ornament. You have something great to say? Um, I don't know if it's great, but very rapidly, because it goes back to what the congressman was saying. But I also think that um, U.S. engagement is important, and I think uh, you know the congressman uh, comes from a, a brand of the Democratic Party and a part of the Democratic Party that maybe with presidential candidates that don't think as much about foreign policy or are very focused on major structural change within the U.S. So it's about thinking, how do we use the energy that we have in the U.S. for the youth uh, for things like the Green New Deal, things like structural massive change uh, you know, domestically? How do we use that and harness that to also think about the international dimensions? Because sometimes those get lost in that structural conversation. I want to thank Alexander. He came over. He didn't have to be here. I didn't, I didn't know you before. But thank you. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad you didn't. I, I want to, I, believe me, I want to be like you. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for being here. And Steve, I'm going to give you the last word. I think we, we know the skills that young people need. We, we talk a lot about the top down and the top down's important, but we also need to be growing from the youth perspective. Uh, you mentioned empathy, which I talk ab about a lot, as a business skill, um, because you understand your customers, you understand you know, the people that you have to work with, your colleagues at work. But we also talk about the 21st century skills, You know what we call the four Cs. If you go to p21.org, you can find the research on this. But um, you know, we, we can't be educating people for the 50s and 60s. We right. need to be educating them for the next decade. And it's critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, teamwork, right. and communications. If we can get those four Cs down plus empathy, we can empower this generation to actually change the entire dynamic of the region. Thank you. Kim, you have a last zinger? Keep an eye on Iraq and Lebanon. Um, it is very important. I think it's a turning point that will um, signal a new phase right. in the Middle East, I am still very hopeful, a new phase in the Middle East that will undo the last uh, 40 years that we've seen since the Iran Revolution, since 1979, and this shroud of blackness that seems to have engulfed us since that revolution and the reaction to it, which right. is, if I may plug my next book, is the subject of my next book. Cool. I really think that Iran's, uh, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, youth there are really pushing back against this shroud of blackness that has engulfed us for the last 40 years and we want to get rid of it. We're done. The Hill would like to do one of your first book interview events. We'll just put that on the table now. A uh, big I'll round of there. applause for Kim Gattis. Thank you so much for joining us. Kush Ch Choksi from the U.S. Chamber, Steve Culbertson from the Youth Services America, Nicole Golden from the Atlantic Council, Malak Alkud, my friend who's uh, just cool, uh, <laughs> Alexander Kleiman, whom I have not met before, from Georgetown, uh, and Munir Pavez from uh, Georgetown as well. So thank you all very much for joining us. We have another phase coming up, and we're going to continue. So my colleague, Julia Mann, Manchester, Voice of God, who is coming up? Thank you to our panelists, both in person and those who joined us via video. Now to hear from local students on their perspectives, please welcome to the stage Abdulaziz Afalahi, a student at George Washington University, Mohammed Ahomami, a master's candidate at Georgetown, Ali Akawar, creative director of the Arab Society at Georgetown, and Yasmin Salam, co-president of the Arab Society at Georgetown. Joining our panelists on stage is Julia Manchester, a staff writer at The Hill. Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for coming to such an interesting topic um, and you know, a good conversation today on such a very interesting, oh no thank you, I'm fine, oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. We're getting very good treatment up here today. It's a busy day in Washington, so we appreciate you all coming here. <laughs> Carbs are good. Um, so just to start out with, you know, we're going to frame this discussion around the Arab Youth Survey and the findings out of that survey. And I just wanted to go through a couple of headlines and a couple of those key findings out of the survey. You know, the survey found that the Financial Times said, young Arabs say jobs and living costs are their biggest concerns. It, um, the national rights that young people expect governments to provide jobs. And that came out of the survey as well. So I just want to open it up to you all. 
what were your biggest takeaways from the survey? And really, you know, what, what did you think of the findings? Were they something you expected or um, was it typical? Abdul Aziz, I'll start with you. So yeah, um, one of the biggest findings I thought were interesting was the high youth unemployment um, and then feeling the government entitlement. Uh, so these are governments that are highly indebted um, that are in a financial condition that can't really respond to such entitlement the youth are demanding. And the government can't really employ 20, 10, 30 million youth. And so it's what I think is necessary is the private sector to come in. Uh, and I think this is something that was said by many of these people and the conclusion we all come into. Um, but these governments also need to look into how, like how easy is it to do business in these areas. If startups can't like, come up, if business isn't um, progressing, if uh, access to capital isn't there, we can't really see such thing happening. Right. Aliyah, what was your biggest takeaway? We know that economic opportunity was a huge theme throughout the survey. And you know, just, I guess, piggybacking off of Abdul Aziz's point, you know, what is the future of economic opportunity for young people in the Arab world? So I think also the core issue of why we don't have the same economic opportunities is because of education. And I think that it's in all stages of education that we need to address how to basically give these students skills that they can use for job opportunities in the future. And that goes from preschool to middle school to skills in university that will help um, Arab youth prepare themselves for jobs that are constantly changing and for skills that we can't really um, know exactly what they are because jobs are becoming more abstract. So I think it's really preparing them through um, improving our educational system. Right. Mohammed and Yasmin, another good key takeaway from the survey was that half of young Arabs say religious values are holding the region back. So Mohammed, starting with you, what's your perspective on this and what specific values do you think are too influential in the region or are they even influential enough? Um, well, I think holding it back is a strong word to right. say the least, but um, there, there, there comes a lot of good and bad mm -hmm. from religious values and from religion in general and that's everywhere, not just in the Arab world. Um, but I, fe I feel there are some certain areas that we can improve upon, uh, particularly in, in, in regards of, um, maybe it's not just religious values, but also like cultural aspects, because a lot of times we mix both, um, they influence both and sometimes they intertwine. Um, and one aspect of that would be the education of, uh, um, for say women leaving or going abroad to study, especially in conservative areas, mm -hmm. it's, it's much easier for a man to go on his own and go to the US or Europe to study. Uh, but that's not the case for, uh, for women, uh, particularly in conservative area. But again, I don't want to paint a stereotypical image of right. the Arab world because the, the, the Arab world also is very diverse and yes. identities uh, are very fluid. And that's something we can talk about. Uh, Talk about absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, I would love to talk about. You know, you're obviously a woman, and there, uh, you know, Muhammad was touching on some of the, you know, key aspects of how women have played into this survey and what has really come out of it. Talk about the role young Arab women are playing right now. And I don't want to paint too broad of a picture, but from your perspective, what kind of ro role are they playing in 2019, and what opportunities lie ahead? Yeah, I think that it's. It's interesting because I think what we're seeing with the youth and like young women, Arab women and men in general is they really just want to reclaim the narrative and they yeah. want to like have access to opportunities. And while they religion is something that's diverse and everybody interprets it in different ways, they just don't want to see it as like a barrier to opportunities. So someone earlier asked like, what does this like separation of religion and like governance look like? So coming from Egypt, like the way religion is taught in schools mm -hmm. is not is not kind of conducive to dialogue and mutual understanding a lot of the time. So I think like an actionable step would be rather than separating, you know, Christians and Muslims in the classroom and teaching them different things, like let's just teach religion from an objective point of view and then at home, however your family wants to introduce it to you, they can. I think that's the kind of change when they say like religious institutions need reform, like that's the kind of thing they're asking for. 
And Arab women specifically, like in 2019, they are really like the movers and shakers. Like yeah. yesterday night, um, the Middle East Institute honored Nadim Babati, who was the first Arab woman to be nominated for a foreign film Oscar. And hearing her speak about what's happening in Lebanon right now and how, you know, she was being honored for this great award, but frankly, all she wanted to do was talk about what's happening in her country and spotlight that. And that's how a lot of Arab women feel. They feel empowered and they want to kind of break this idea that there's this silence and like creative mediums are really feel it, filling the gap of how they can express that. So all four of you are studying in the DC area at Georgetown and George Washington. And you know, one, another uh, find, key finding for the survey that caught my eye was that three and four young Arabs say they are unhappy with the quality of education in their country. And more than half say they would choose to pursue higher education in the West. So I would love to get your perspectives on your education um, growing up and you know, how it, your perspective of uh, education in the US and the higher education system here and how do you think it, you know, could it be improved in the Middle East or could it be improved over here as well? I'll start with you, Abdulaziz. So um, for me, I'm quite privileged. The education system in the UAE is, is top notch and it's been progressing throughout the years. So the reason why I'm here in the US is m not necessarily just for education, mm -hmm. It's more to get more of the American culture, the networks, and getting to know this environment. And one of the reasons why I come to the US or why the UAE sends me to the US is to bring that knowledge back home. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a constant state of progressing education um, and really teaching um, students and youth back home. Absolutely. Malia? Yeah, so just to build on that. Um, so growing up in Jordan, the school system wasn't really about like encouraging the whole person. It was more about following a certain criteria. You need to achieve this grade. You need so it was very um, kind of focused on that. And coming to the US, I really got the opportunity to take so many diverse classes, whether it was like public speaking or I found that I was passionate about cognitive neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And I feel like just pushing you to experiment in the liberal arts curriculum really made me realize things that I wouldn't have necessarily found out about myself. And I still think that I'm very hopeful that we can um, see what, what's, what's um, succeeding in the West and kind of taking some of those approaches and um, kind of figuring out how we can apply that um, to the Middle East and to our school systems. Um, and I know you have a background in art. I would love to hear how you feel that art is really changing the dialogue back at home in Jordan or you know, in, in you know, maybe some other um, sectors of Middle East society and how you're using it to really, I guess, create more of a dialogue mm -hmm. in society. Yeah, and I was actually thinking about this. So like yeah. we've been talking about the survey and the statistics of, of what the Arab youth want and, and what they want to see in the future. But at the same time, we're forgetting that art actually gives us another window of what they're really feeling and what they want to express through a different medium that anyone can literally understand and kind of feel that emotion as well. Um, and I think art really has a role in kind of pushing this idea of, of Arab unity because now, um, for example, online, I have a like Arab art blog that I can basically share art whether it's from established Arab artists or upcoming artists, um, Egyptians, Jordanians, Iraqis, all on one platform that kind of gives a sense of unity. And, and that gets a lot of response from whether it's Arabs or non-Arabs who are just interested in the art and kind of want to encourage these artists to represent their countries and show more of a hopeful um, kind of vision for what the Arab world can be and the talent that we have. Absolutely. And Mohammed, you grew up in Palestine. Yeah. and. Obviously, the situation between Israel and Palestine is quite complicated, and Palestinians are living under an occupation. What was it like growing up under that, and how was you know, and how did that impact your education and your view of the conflict, and maybe your view of the rest of the Middle East as well? Right. Um, well, growing up in that kind of environment, you you normalize it in a, in many ways. So you you don't realize how different it is outside of of Palestine, or I grew up in Gaza Strip, so it was more mm -hmm. enclosed. Um, so you don't realize how different it is living in that area and, and, and how the situation is outside. You're looking, you know, you watch movies, of course, you, you watch TV shows, and you, 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 you see these images on the TV screen. Um, but it doesn't really hit you until you actually leave. 
Uh, I was privileged enough to, to participate in a, a Hindi de Luger youth exchange and study program where I came here in high school for a year. Um, and that's, that was the first time where, where, I, where I realized uh, that the situation back home was, was uh, incredibly uh, unsustainable, incredibly inhumane. Um, so uh, it was very eye-opening and an and experience, I, something I experienced also and I've seen uh, throughout the, with my colleagues, the Palestinians, is that as soon as you leave, you, you, you become more, uh, there's this passion or push for you to also like represent Palestine and to, to talk about what is happening and to, to uh, 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 try to actually create a change from the grassroots level. Right. Um, in terms of education, uh, I think one of the major uh, differences I've, that I've found, I noticed, because I've, since I've done high school here and college, one year in high school and college, uh, there is a focus here on uh, critical thinking and discussion that is not uh, very prevalent back home, since uh, uh, a lot of in our schools, uh, it's mostly about uh, memorization and putting it in the, uh, on the final, et cetera, especially in public education. It doesn't mean it's good, it doesn't mean it's bad, it's just a different way of approaching education. Um, and I wasn't surprised really when, with the statistic that 50% want to pursue, you know, from the Arab youth want to pursue their education here in the West, um, not only because it's a great opportunity to learn, and as, as you said, it's a, it's a way for also to like learn the culture and learn the values and uh, the, uh, engage with the Western audi uh, audience and uh, people here, but also it's a, it's a gateway also for, for a greater economic opportunities, right. because the way for them, um, to be able to uh, pursue, whether do you want to pursue jobs in the West, in the US or Europe, Europe, or have better opportunities back home, the biggest way to do it, or the best way to do it, is to have an education here in the States, whether it's for the name or for the actual education that you get. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and Yasmin, you um, were born and raised in London, England, I believe, and now you're studying in Georgetown. So, you know, what is your percep perception of education in the West versus, you know, um, education um, back where your parents, Egypt, or where, where your parents are from originally? You know, tell me about that, and were you surprised by the findings in the survey? Yeah, I think that the U.S. offers this kind of flexibility mm -hmm. to dapple in a lot of different things that even, like, Europe doesn't offer. So that was one reason why I was so attracted to, like, yeah. U.S. universities is because I wanted the space to learn more about Arab culture, Arab history, but also not only focus on that. And that's why I'm super appreciative that a US education could give me that. So there's even differences like within the West that's also not monolithic, like there's so many different types of education. But I just think that like hearing like from my cousins and my family and everybody in Egypt, like there's just this rigidity of learning that a lot of uh, people on the panel have touched on. And what the youth crave is just more like flexibility in how they like express themselves and what they choose to study in these universities. So I think like Lebanon has like the lar like the largest number of graphic designers per capita. Like it's super creative. It's the number one most popular major in AUB and things like that. And that's what the youth wants more space to do that than the typical kind of medical lawyer engineer route, which is definitely something my parents didn't tell me to do. Like right. I'm studying like Arab film, so they'd have a heart attack if they wanted they wanted that with me, <laughs> <laughs> but that's like what the youth are asking for and the survey is showing that with like education and like broader opportunities and a variety of things. Right, I'm gonna wrap with a very general um, question. You know, where do you all see um, Arab youth going or the future of young people in the Arab world going in the next five years or so? I know it's very contingent upon, from a country to country basis, but from your experiences, where do you see um, that generation of young people going, Abdulaziz? Yeah, so I think there's a lot more attention being made for the youth, and rightly so. Um, the UAE also has this really good framework in including the youth with the government and creating that dialogue, but also exporting that concept to the region around us. Um, also, governments really realize that the youth could be their greatest asset or their worst liability. And so they really want to capitalize on, on, on the youth. Absolutely. Malia, yeah. what's your take? Um, I just want to emphasize the, um, the importance of technology with the Arab youth. And I think because there's a huge diaspora, um, I see a huge, I see technology as being a way for the Arab youth to remain connected 
and social media, and social media, media and like yeah. everything they're doing to organize these protests and and kind of call for for their own rights, as someone said, just their basic rights. Right. Um, so. I kind of see that happening in the future, more unity and connectivity. Absolutely, and I know you two kind of have a bit of a journalistic background, and we're talking about social media here. So from your perspectives as you know, young people working in journalism, where do you see this going? And I'd love to hear your, both of your takes on social media and how it's playing into this, and I'll start with you, Mohammed. Um, so I, I worked as a manager for a journalistic initiative called We Are Not Numbers, and one of, uh, uh, one of the goals is to have Palestinian youth tell their own stories using their own words, and social media played a big part of, uh, of that. Because we're tired of like having other people speak for us and, and and painting us in a picture that is not representative of us. And particularly when it comes to the media as well, where a lot of times, because the way it's just the media is structured, you know, they, there's like lots of numbers. You know, this number of people died, this number of people injured. But what matters to us is to actually tell our own stories using our own words, the, showing the face behind the number. Uh, and, and social media and media in general was uh, a great asset in that. But honestly, to, to go back to your first question, uh, sorry, but like where do the youth uh, see themselves yeah. in five years? Uh, I can't speak for the Arab world, but I can speak for Gaza, and I feel it's a very, it's a very peculiar case, because I feel in five years, they're gonna be s still the same. It's a very stagnated uh, uh, area, uh, um, and they don't really see prospect for, for the future where they are. They try, they, they work hard, and they try to use whether the internet or social media to do freelance and whatnot. But with the whole siege, what's going on and the occupation, it's very hard to uh, see themselves moving forward in five years, which is why a lot of them are pushed into desperation, whether to leave the, the Gaza Strip, a lot of people do leave, whether legally or illegally uh, in many ways, or to other desperation like what we see on the border with the, with the protesters and whatnot. So where, where, where are we going to be in five years in Gaza? I don't know, but it's not going to be, uh, I don't see it being a very positive thing mm -hmm. otherwise, uh, unless the situation or the political situation changes. Right. Yeah, Yasmin. Yeah, the finding that young people go more to social media rather than like traditional modes of media is particularly salient just because like I would love to be a journalist like on the ground in Egypt and go back to Egypt, but that is extremely difficult. Independent journalism is right. basically non-existent there. And I think that you see what's happening in Lebanon now, and Iraq, and all these uprisings, and people are using social media to tell their stories because they don't trust traditional media to do that. So I'm gonna venture that in five years, probably a bit more, maybe we're gonna see this new like emerging wave of is the digital media or maybe traditional modes kind of changing their model to reflect more on like what the people are actually like discussing and national dialogue that kind of you see it in film and art already. They're already tackling social taboos, but I'd like to see like the media tackle that now. Right, absolutely. And um, you intern at CNN, D CNN's DC bureau right now. I did as well when I was um, getting my graduate degree. But where do you see you know yourself as a young journalist in the states? Would you want to stay in the U.S.? I'm putting you on the spot here, so I apologize. But <laughs> no, would fine. you want to stay here in the U.S. or would you want to um, go abroad somewhere? Honestly, I'm in two minds just because. I've, like, I have an international background. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in the US, so being in the US can feel a bit isolating because everybody that I've kind of grown up with is back in Egypt or in Europe. So it's difficult. Also, the stories I care about like more personally tend to not be mm -hmm. here. But at the same time, I think representation is just so important. And like when I kind of turn on TV or read an article and I see someone's name that's just like a little bit more similar than mine, like that really excites me. And I think that whether it's abroad or on the ground doesn't really make the difference. Like if you're contributing to that. Um, so as long as I do that, I'm not sure exactly where I'll be. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for such a wonderful discussion. Don't, thank you. don't leave yet. Oh, don't um, leave yeah, yet. Yeah. Okay. We're it's staying. Julia, uh, first of all, thank you. You're thank an you. awesome <laughs> colleague, my favorite <laughs> colleague at the Hill. Don't tell anyone oh. else there. Um, uh, but thank you for me to do this. And you know, I just want to say a couple of comments. These, these students here, and some of the ones in the room, Munir and others, um, and, and really dozens and dozens and scores of others I've enjoyed getting. I, we literally, my team and I just called them up out of the blue. Muhammad, I read a story about, said, hey, you know, and it, you, know, you thought I was crazy at the beginning, right? <laughs> and and, and uh, Munir, I called, and, and he was so modest because I was inviting somebody to a fancy dinner, and he didn't suggest himself, but he did suggest everyone else. And I said, dude, you got to come too. So uh, <laughs> I just want to say thank you for trusting us to do, you know, to help you 
tell your stories and you know do these good things. So it's been awesome. So Julia, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we need to bring this to, to a close because we're running out of time. But I want to say, uh, William Lawrence, um, I don't even know you, I don't think. Have we met before? You're way cool. I mean, he just sent me a whole <laughs> list of things that, you know, blind spots that we didn't get to. I love this kind of, you know, he talked about Algeria and Sudan protests being bigger than Iraq and Lebanon, that trends in Qatar and Turkey are something we need to, to include. Uh, and then he made a really profound comment that I think is very important because I've been talking about modernity in a way, in a kind of reckless, uh, imprecise way. But you made this comment that perhaps what we're looking at is a postmodern model of hybrid roles and much more inclusive which I think is a wonderful model, and so I just want to say thank you, because this is a beginning of a, <coughs> a discussion that we hope to have with all of you and keep it going. So thank you all so much for doing this. What a great day. Peter, I know you're going to close this out and say a few words, but thank you for letting us play. I'll tell you one last thing. I used to live, anybody from West Hollywood? No, um, nobody wants to admit it, but um, I, I lived in West Hollywood across from the original Spago restaurant, Wolfgang Puck's first restaurant, and I lived right across the street, and the um, LA Times uh, calendar section had a giant profile of the most powerful man in Los Angeles, and he said it was the maitre d' at that restaurant. So I tried to be the maitre d' today. <laughs> so that's what this was about. I hope you enjoyed the cafe style, uh, a new way to do programs uh, for the Hill. I want to thank all of you. Thank Julia. Peter, close us out. <laughs> yes, Bob. Bob, thank you. Thank you so much to our panel of students. Julia, thank you to all of our guests today, the congressman. Uh, thank you so much to our underwriters, uh, UAE, the, the embassy and the ambassador. Thank you for making this possible. Once again, thank you to Steve Clemens, our maitre d', our host. If you missed any portion of today's discussion, you'll be able to find that at thehill.com. Uh, the whole live stream will be available. We encourage you, as Steve mentioned, to keep this conversation going, both with us, uh, IRL, I think as the kids say, or you can do it uh, on Twitter using the hashtags that we've shared. And then finally, for those in the room, those who've been here, please do look out for that electronic survey to give us feedback. Thank you so much for being here today, for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of the day.